So it's my great pleasure to introduce now, coming to you from Germany, Marquat Lund, who will now be speaking about and showing flint napping scenes from the Beni Hassan tombs viewed and interpreted by a contemporary flint napper. Thank you, Mike. Test, test. Can I, am I to hear? Yeah. Um, the emotional stress Carolyn just mentioned, uh, I know the stress very good um, from several hours of flint napping. Um, and in fact, today, as Carolyn already mentioned, um, uh, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, to me, there are several giants of flint napping in the uh, experimental flint napping literature. I just know them from, from, from the books they wrote. Uh, the names are Francois Bortz from France, Jacques Pellegrin, Jacques Tixier, Eric Callahan from the United States, Bruce Bradley from the United States. Those, to me, led the way for, for others for flint napping. And also today, in the United States, flint napping is a top hobby. Thousands of flint nappers, mostly weekend craftsmen, are working in flint. And their main intention is not to, uh, to explain archaeological finds, but to produce beautiful showpieces. Just uh, as I have the idea sometimes with some Egyptian flintnap stuff. Um, uh, I like to say that I learned flintnapping by myself, but in fact, um, the know how, so the exercising I learned by myself, but um, the facts around it I got from books. So and now I'd like to, to do a, a, in three different uh, sections. The first sections I like to show as flintnapping is done today, by, mostly by also experimental flint nappers as well as, as hobby flint nappers. Uh, afterwards, I will also show a bit about the butchering scenes uh, and my personal view on, of this. Uh, and at last, uh, about the uh, Beni Hassan scenes. So I may start uh, with a little look into the case of the tools which are needed. At first, leather for that the emotional stress won't be followed by blood. <coughs> and these this is a quick, quite simple toolkit I use, and we will start with the three major principal techniques which we use for flint napping. It's quite simple. These, um, oh, about the flint, I should say a few words about flint. Um, if you see me napping now, you should imagine that this, just imagine it, it'll be a piece of glass because uh, from the qualities, from the f physical qualities of the stone, it behaves much like glass. Um, good flint, good nappable flint has to be, has to have three attributes. Um, it has to be homogeneous, that means free of flaws or fossils or inclusions. And by the way, there's always something inside. Um, I like to blame the material if I don't succeed with it. Um, <clears throat> And um, it has to be brittle, so flakes can be uh, knocked off. And also it has to be elastic. Uh, it sounds strange that it is elastic, but um, if you hear this, this proves that the material is elastic. Um, okay. So, first protection. This is how most nappers today work. <clears throat> and this is the direct hard percussion, as it is called and hard because of, there's a stone used for it and like this you can pop off flakes so this is direct hard percussion and all the pieces I don't know if we can see this um, this is the point I hit the stone we call platform and just beneath this with a stone you have some kind of bulb of force which shows in a way uh, the fracture front which travels through the stone um, it has been said that with a um, uh, softer hammerstone, and this is a soft, softer one, um, the stone travels with about, uh, the fracture front travels with about half the speed of sound through the stone. <clears throat> I don't know how they measured that. <clears throat> okay, and this... Now I'm preparing a platform. <clears throat> And then something, what is also done with stone, is the so-called abrading. Abrading is quite interesting because um, it's only uh, identified on very few archaeological finds. 
Uh, but in fact, almost all nappers today use this. So there is something, something which is different with the archaeological record. There is a braiding in the past. A braiding means nothing else that I'm brushing away very small pieces from the edge of the stone. And it's also a bit like grinding sometimes for me. So, and now we try to chop off a longer piece. So, I have to change the angle because critical in flint napping is to get, to hold special angles. Um, you need an angle of uh, less than 90 degrees to pop off a flake by chopping off here on the top of the platform. That's very, and the, and the force, if you, if you take a blow in the middle of the stone, the fracture force goes with a so-called Hertzian cone, idealized like a volcano into the stone, but um, it will, it st steps in, you won't get a flake of it. And if you, if you chop on the, on the margins, uh, just a part of this cone is uh, released, and this gives us some kind of control over the, the, uh, the flint napping act. Okay, in this case also the material is quite nervous. <coughs> so this sh should be enough at first for showing direct hard percussion and you see all these little ugly flakes, they all are quite sharp. And now we come to the next part which is the direct soft percussion. This is nothing more than using a piece of organic material uh, sometimes uh, the flakes uh, look pretty much like hard percussion and also the other way around, so um, it's sometimes difficult to explain. Um, this is a piece of reindeer antler, and that's the part which is near the head, uh, where the so-called compactor, uh, the, the good material of the, uh, of the antler, is quite thick. And pieces like this have been found in the uh, archaeological record in the caves of southern Germany and France, and we uh, haven't even found here in the little in the contact zones where you hit the stone with, um, you find very little flakes embedded. So we know how they were used. And in fact, it looks pretty much the same, but it needs much more abrading or preparing the platforms. Careful that they don't fall into my shoes. And you see this goes pretty fast and in a few minutes you have awful lot of flakes. And near my home where you can find lots of this tabular raw material which is um, from the Baltic Sea, um, on the fields all around my home, everywhere, the fields are scattered with the stuff. <clears throat> and uh, in Egypt, I have heard the same. So in a few minutes, I would be able to, to get out here a hand axe, probably the most uh, popular biface, and bifaces, the name bifaces is just because flakes are driven off from both faces of the, two, of the piece. That's, and so a rough hand axe is a biface, and the nice knives you saw on, on the pictures from Carolyn's lecture are also bifaces. Well, some people wondering how, why uh, the softer material as antler is definitely softer than flint. Flint has a hardness of about 7 on a scale of 1 to 10. Um, so it's one of the hardest materials in nature. Um, how the softer material can work the harder material. But um, when I was 10 years old, um, I made an experiment when I drew a leather football through the window, through the glass window of my parents' home. Uh, <laughs> 
since then I think I've proven that softer material can work the harder stuff. Okay, so this is direct percussion with a soft instrument. And now we come to pressure flaking. So this was percussion flaking. Um, and pressure flaking I want to show uh, with a tool, a special tool, um, and also a knife. When the Tyrolean Iceman was found in the Alps in 1991, um, he had with him, it was a closed find, so we know all the things we, that were found were, belonged together. And he had a very little, archaeologists say, a dagger, because it has two edges. To me, of course, it was used as a knife. Um, he had this knife with him, and he had this tool. And this was immediately, um, could be explained by Flint Nevers as a tool used for pressure flaking. Um, I made these pretty much uh, in the dimensions of the originals. And um, in fact, even before this was found, uh, today's flint nappers use tools pretty much looking the same like this. Um, so it was discovered very, very early that this is a tool for flint napping. Um, and pressure flaking, oh, I need, I'm looking for, yeah. Pressure flaking is, uh, in a way, it's, uh, it's extremely slow motion percussion flaking. Um, and uh, the knife uh, of the Iceman was pretty sharp, but also it, it shows, uh, for pressure flaking, very small, thin uh, flake scars. Flake scars are the negatives left by the flakes. When you see the drawings, even these are it's not very beautiful drawings, but every outline onto the knife shows the remnants, the negative of uh, the negative scar of a released flake before, and um, for pressure flaking we do today mostly like this. You take the pressure flaker with a thumb near the, the tip of the flaker, um, and in the palm of the hand we hold the uh, the piece which has to be uh, worked, and then at first the the um, power is initiated, soft, and you hear, I don't know if you hear, heard the sound, it's not very beautiful sound, I think. And you can have additional pressure force if you use uh, your legs as a lever. Every time a little flake is released, and very small flakes fall down. These flakes, by pressure flaking, are quite thin. And when you look at the uh, knife on the top row, this is a pre-dynastic ripple flake or Gozean knife, uh, Carolyn al already talked about. Um, the surface, you see, has this regular scar pattern. And this scar pattern is uh, just because of the grinding. And uh, pressure flaking just gets us very, very thin flakes. So if you grind the surface before and then pressure flake it, you can get this very regular pressure pattern. So I'm just through with the sharpening of this little piece. So the edge again, it looks pretty rough, but it's quite sharp. So that was the first part about napping. <clears throat> now I'd like to show a bit about the uh, buttering scene. Oh, at first, I'd like to show this knife from uh, Omer Kwab, from the tomb of Jair. Um, it was, I'd like to show here special features of these knives, uh, uh, different to the knives we saw before. Here you see the scar pattern is pretty much irregular. Um, oh, where's the laser pointer? Sorry. Somebody stole it. Oh, I... I my eyes. Um, what I'd like to show at first is the cross section about here, which shows a perfect lenticular uh, cross section. Um, and also the view here on the, on the edge. This is the cutting edge of the knife. Um, and you see the cutting edge is almost exactly in the plane uh, of, the, uh, of the knife. This is uh, a sign for a just very new, just, uh, just made piece. Uh, which hasn't been uh, rendered anyhow. <clears throat> and now I'd like to 
come to the and, and this uh, what I I personally like this knife very much. It's not very typical. Uh, the handle section is very typical for the first dynasty, um, but it's quite uh, very very curved. <clears throat> so um, this is from all the uh, tomb pictures from the uh, old kingdom I have seen. Probably uh, the best scene, which could be pressure flaking during a buttering scene. Um, um, we see the, the pressure flaker which is used is quite short and the hand is very near uh, to the tip of the tool uh, which overlaps here a bit. Um, to me this is it's the shortest, the shortest pressure, probable pressure, pressure flaker I've ever seen on, the, on these thumb boards. Normally, uh, as far as I can say, they look pretty much more like this. Uh, uh, so we have quite a long distance between the grip of the handle uh, and the tip of the tool. And um, to modern flint knappers, lo this looks clearly uh, a bit awkward. Um, um, I will come to this later. I will show the next one. This is uh, from the museum in Vienna, probably found at Abuzir. Um, what I found very interesting with this piece is, I hope it could be, could be seen, if you look exactly here, you see tip of the tool and then you see a little thing and if you count the fingers here it's one two three here's a thumb so I think this is the uh, the index figure which did some work in the whole process um, now let's have a look at the next one and this is something which is also interesting as another example uh, we see uh, the, the probable pressure flaker quite uh, quite it looks more like a uh, the piece I showed for percussion flaking, quite thick, but this could be, uh, I used a piece, I will show this afterwards, uh, probably these things show just from the, from the perspective you see, they look large, but if you look from the other direction, they might be quite, quite thin. Um, <clears throat> um, I, as I'm not an Egyptologist, I was told what is written above this means resharpening. So we know uh, this is the, the, uh, the what, is, what happens here. The act of flint napping isn't producing anything, but it's resharpening the knife. Okay, and the next picture. This dynamic, I like it very much. This dynamic picture shows, to, what, as far as I've seen, the, quite, the longest tool which is used for, for this napping act, uh, which is pretty, pretty long. And we also see the finger here, which is quite interesting. And um, we also see the way the knife is held. <clears throat> well, I made a knife like that. Um, it's just having good control, having the finger on the back of the knife. Here's again, here, that's the one where we see the fingers best, the index finger at work. Uh, in fact, as far as I know, uh, these scenes haven't been mentioned much in the experimental uh, uh, archaeological uh, literature. Uh, I'm wondering about this. I don't understand this because it's quite interesting. There's much to look at, I think. Um, and then we have the next one. And this was, uh, we have seen one from, uh, from Carolyn. This is another one from Giza, from the tomb of Imeri. Uh, where well, I, I have uh, the line drawing from Kent Weeks' book, and uh, I, I took a part of the photo, and here you see also flakes falling down. Um, the tool is one of the rare cases where the tool is, is not in contact with the blade. You see it at some distance of the blade. And as Karen already said, these were first missed for blood. In fact, when you look closely at the forms of these pieces, they look pretty much like flakes. Uh, this was, uh, I think the person who, the artist uh, who painted this scene, pretty knew, knew very, very good what, what he saw. And here, my personal favorite, one of my personal favorites of Egyptian flint knives is on top. Not only is the material simply phenomenal, um, but also the, uh, the work of this piece is 35 centimeters long. Um, and has this beautiful structures in the stone. And below you see um, 
a knife from uh, which is shown in the Petri Museum of Egyptian Archaeology, and I brought both knives to the same scale. They can be seen on exactly the same scale. And on the left, um, I have two, um, uh, I have two uh, cross sections, idealized cross sections also. And um, I think uh, for the top knife, the left cross section with this pristine condition shows us uh, the pristine knife. On the other, on, on, uh, the other knife, shows this, about and this area from there to there. Uh, the piece is obviously resharpened um, <clears throat> uh, and ending with this pretty much beveling here, which we also heard from Carolinda. And I had a close look at this beveling, just for looking. Do these scars we see there, are they looking like uh, pressure flaking or percussion flaking? That's a major question. Uh, which I can't, pr which I can't, uh, I don't have the ultimate idea about that, but um, <clears throat> I'd like to show, as, as they normally all do this in standing position, I don't have a kettle here, um, <clears throat> so that's one way. Um, also, what you never see on these pictures is something protection, anywhere protection for the hands or for the legs. Uh, I need that. I'm normally sitting in a bureau. Uh, my hands are quite uh, difficult to hold it. So I made this from a bone, a bone, a cattle bone. Um, and now what? Resharpening, pressure flaking. Gripped the piece, the, the tool gripped at the far end. I think it proves it works quite good. And uh, we see, uh, I also have this rough outline of the cutting edge now. But probably, probably, it could also be done. Axel Eggebrecht, in his work about the, uh, the, the uh, resharpening scenes, he, uh, he said this is pressure flaking, because percussion flaking is very risky for the tool. Uh, in fact, it is. But it only is when the percussion tool you use has a quite a lot of mass. But this piece is quite light at the end, has absolutely no mass. So this works. And even if I don't have that good control about that, There's no problem for afterwards with the same tool. Just clean this out. So it works. Both works probably. So I think we have to look exactly at the archaeological record, at the origi original pieces, which I can't, for finding out what happened there. For, for my own observation of this piece, of the lower piece there, I think for sure this was percussion flaking. But on the other pieces, I don't know. OK, that about the buttering scenes. Um, here's another example I want to show, I forgot, um, from Abu Zir, published by Vachala and Svoboda. And here also is one thing I'd like to point at, that is, uh, the edge is also resharpened in this piece, and we see also the rough outline of the, of the, uh, of the edge. Um, but in this case, the edge is resharpened from both faces. Uh, at least that's my interpretation from looking at the picture. I have to be careful. <laughs> but what you see here, to me, uh, is a resharpening of the first act, of, and what we see here, it's the last phase of resharpening of this phase. And I'd also like to point out at this what I outlined yellow here, uh, which is the cortex, the white stuff you see also here uh, on, on the nodule. Um, 
And this shows us that this knife has been made out of tabular material, tabular raw material. Uh, no doubt about that. Um, the raw material, as far as I know, in Egypt comes also in large nodular form and also in flat form. So um, this might be f uh, interesting for the following part. So now this is a knife type from uh, the Middle Kingdom. It's from Tel El Daba. And here also you see uh, on the handle area, you see that what I outlined yellow, raw material was tabular flint in this part. And you see also that the quality of flaking uh, obviously decreased here, uh, which is sometimes, uh, there are exceptions of course, but uh, as far what I have seen and, and what Andreas Tillman wrote, I think uh, the quality of napping is decreasing in the Middle Kingdom. <clears throat> Petri, by the way, found uh, a, a partly half the knife of this type where some plant fibers were wound around the handle part. So now we come to Beni Hassan. Um, what I framed here is absolutely a famous scene for me. Um, what is written above it has been translated by Beatrice Midorain as uh, napping flints or napping knives. Um, others just say it means flint napping. Um, and then th we see these four persons in the frame at work. Um, <clears throat> and we have a better picture from the original publication from Griffith here. It's all, again, the same scene, both faces, and we have this pretty nice uh, painting here uh, from the publication. And if you watch, or if you watch it closely, uh, we see two major activities here. Um, oh, I should start another way. Um, these scenes are mentioned in the literature, in the archaeological experimental flint mapping literature, only very randomly. And uh, uh, in fact, if you look at it and you have seen me napping, if you have the intention that was the same, if you look at the tools here, they look quite long, very long. And they're gripped in the middle. And the thumb is away from the workstone. And again, we see the same scene here. Thumb away from the, from the workstone. Uh, the stone looks um, like a, a lanceolate. And then we have another scene here. So obviously, he's watching what he's doing. That's my interpretation. He, watch, he looks, if everything's OK with the... Uh, um, with the uh, former work which he has just done. And then we see this. And I read that these scenes, according to the rules of Egyptian art, are not accurate to the original subject of flint napping. That was said by Midon Reigns, by Andreas Tillmann, by many, many people. Many said, this is not, this is only the meaning of flint napping, but isn't, they, there isn't any accuracy, accuracy he has shown. But, um, I saw, I saw them and I had the same feeling. My flint napping doesn't look like that. Um, but I saw then this here. And I thought this was pretty much interesting. What is he doing here? There's a block on the ground. Maybe here was also a block. We don't know. This looks a little bit disturbed. I don't know. Um, here. This looks a bit like what you've seen me doing. So, but that was, was, was very interesting for me. So I have a next. And this is from the second tomb at Beni Hassan. Well, we have a s almost, not, not really similar, but very, very similar scene, but not identical, of course. And we see on the top row what is shown there, and we see pretty many knives. It, seemed, it looks they're very productive. <laughs> um, and we see someone watching them. For me, flint napping is just fun. This doesn't look like fun to me. Um, <clears throat> and we see here three heaps of knives, almost finished knives. Here they always have handles. And here also finished knives. And then we see here these persons, also obviously in the same action as in Bakht's tomb. 
And we also have this scene again here. And you have here an enlarged painting by Howard Carter, by the way. Um, <clears throat> and here again the napping scene, and here again the scene with this block on the ground. The blocks here in this grave are black. And we see pretty detailed the tools and how they were held. Again, the thumb is away from the worked stone. And the, the pieces, they have two colors. They are made of two colors. We have the black color for the handle part and a red color here. And um, Beatrice Midorens had, had the idea that this may be copper. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I thought this was very interesting. Um, but I had never seen someone napping like that, so um, I asked a friend in Cornwall, Neil Burridge, for uh, casting me a massive copper piece. Today, in, in the United States, many, many weekend nappers use copper for their tools, but they use them, their tools look almost the same like these. It's just wood with a copper tip on it, and it's mostly only a thin piece, and for, for weight, for additional weight, they put in some lead. Um, in this case, I just had the idea make a tool which looks almost the same like in the Beni Hassan tombs. Um, <clears throat> and I made this. And in fact, I'm used to this way of napping since 30 years. I'm napping for 30 years now. Um, and it's quite difficult to get away from uh, a way you were walking all the time. So I spent some Sunday evenings with this piece. Um, um, I gave blood for that. <coughs> and I'd like now to... Test, test, okay. Okay, now I have here, again, a piece of tabular material from Denmark. This is really top stuff from Denmark, the best it has to give. I hope so. <clears throat> also, the position, sitting on a chair, is very, very sure cultural related. In fact, I don't think anywhere in the world people sat on chairs were flaking, probably uh, the Gunflint, Nappers and Brandon excluded. But when we see Australian Aborigines um, or uh, the Indians in North America, they use, they, they, as far as I know, they didn't sit on chairs. So, and here we also don't, we see, they don't sit on chairs, they sit on the ground. They are kneeling in front of each other. Um, <clears throat> and now let's see if it works. It is, at first, very awkward. It's, completely other feeling. Also, for copper, uh, the platforms where you hit, they have to be um, made a bit in another way. They have to be a bit more steep and more, more, more massive. This activity, what I'm doing exactly at the moment, isn't shown in any of the toms, but to me, I need this for getting good results. Flint damping is nothing more than physics, so chopping of flakes, which are predicted in a way, for me just works also like this. And you see, the length of the flake, this is quite important that you're getting able to get in the middle of the piece so it becomes, it has to become faster, thinner than it has it's becoming more slender. Otherwise you end up with a bulky little piece. And in fact, as I'm not used to copper, or I wasn't used to copper, um, it took me quite a long time. So, in its analysis of, uh, of 
bifacial of the production of bifacial knives at uh, the big Vadi um, Vadi El Sheikh area, where is a quite big shirt mine, which was used during the uh, pharaonic times. Um, he said that knives were started with a with an etched with a bifacial etched area. So let's see. Ladies and gentlemen, after some time, you will notice that on the part you are hitting with, there are quite a lot of little humps and bumps, um, undulations, um, and after some time, these little battered parts, uh, they don't uh, release controlled flakes. When you hit the platform of the stone, you need a smooth area where the, where the force uh, can be initiated. So, after time, every flint napper today, if he uses copper in the United States or if he uses antler, has to regrind this area. Today, this is mostly made with, uh, um, <coughs> with machinery or some rasps or so. But I remember this scene, and I thought, mm, to me, that looks, in a way, quite accurate. And in fact, to me, it looks like if this person is just regrinding his snapping tool, nothing else. And even if you look at the angle he is holding it, it looks quite straight. The angle just shows me that the top of this tool is made rounded. This is ground rounded. If you and after some time grinding, which takes a little time, you have re-established re this good, smooth surface you need for flint mapping. So, Making a bifacial knife with a thickness of less than one centimeter is quite a risky task. Um, uh, at first, you spend many, many hours working at this, and, and near the last part, nearing competition, it's quite uh, depressing when breaking the part. And in fact, I need for a bifacial knife, for a good knife, about five to six hours to complete it. So I can't show this in a complete session here. But probably one thing about this, this is just made after drawing. Normally in experimental archaeology, you make things after finds. So we have to be careful. Of course, this could be made of probably ivory or some else material, which is hard enough. Even some woods would be OK. But uh, one problem is you need mass. And copper really has good mass for that. Uh, I'm skeptical if wood or something else would work in the dimensions which are shown. But um, I don't know how accurate these pictures are. To me, at least, they are a probable way of how knives were produced. Um, I had greatest difficulties of thinning with this way and with this tool um, when the piece is thicker than two centimeters. So I, it's just, just the thought um, that these pieces are quite good for using tabular flat material. And 
as I've shown in the picture of the knife before, um, pretty much, pretty many knives were made out of tabular raw material. So I need to get some bigger flakes now. To me, this is controlled flaking, and with controlled flaking, I'm in a way convinced that with this way, bifacial knives can be made, <clears throat> but sadly, I can't prove that these pictures show the ancient reality with some accuracy. It's just a thought. So now I'm making um, a platform an isolated platform for hopefully one for one good stroke. I would also be interested in how much of this abrading thing was used in Egypt. That would be quite interesting. I know that in my, at near my uh, near my home for producing bifacial daggers, uh, there was in the last phase of the work is abrading used, but not in the, fast, in the first parts. This is very good to see on the original artifacts. It's just you can feel it if it's, if it's on, the, on the flakes or not. Well, that worked. And we eliminated a hump here on this part. And now we go to the next one. After edging, it becomes a bit more complicated. When you, you're looking at the undulations of the piece and you always try to eliminate the humps. Never work uh, where there's a depression, but always work where uh, there's a, a hill. In fact, many American nappers, as I said already, use copper boppers. They call them copper boppers. And uh, there also is the legend that they, were, that they are easier to master in flint mapping. To me, this is just a selling argument, um, <clears throat> as antler tools are pretty much more uh, expensive. It worked. This is what flint in reality is all about. It's preparing platforms um, where you have to hit in the right angle. The spectacular flake removal when a large piece of flint breaks off isn't that difficult to make. Always have the right platforms prepared. And today, most flint nappers also use um, Carborundum, uh, some, some unnatural stone which, which abrades very fast. And so many of them get more and more uh, addicted to this, uh, to this uh, abrading thing, <coughs> which goes. Oh, and C. 
sitting like this. I'm not Egyptian. Oh. If, you exp if you allow me, I'll take a seat. Now you see, um, this will be in the future the cutting edge, I hope so. Um, <clears throat> and at first, and you, you also see I, I thin the piece where, where it's black now for pretty much a part. And um, the thing which is described about Egyptian napping is that uh, the production of these uh, Middle Kingdom knives is they made at first the, the, the cutting edge and afterwards, which is pretty simple, with tabular material, afterwards the back of the knife. Um, okay, but I might a little break and show. We go one picture back. And here's one thing which is special about this, I'd like to show again. Um, it's this. This is the, the only piece from Beni Hassan uh, where the thumb is orientated to the work rock. So, Questions, what is he doing in this moment? It could be, as in the buttering scene, pressure flaking or lighter, very slight percussion flaking. Okay, this side is not that beautiful. We try it here. <clears throat> and to remove here a flake. In fact, the length of the tools is also very interesting because for normal percussion flaking, with a tool like this gripped in the middle, even if the hand, handhold position would be wrong, um, and you would use it like this, you would always slash on your arm. It's ugly, that doesn't work. <clears throat> and the other thing would be like this. I couldn't work like this. I don't even think that anybody who trains with this could work like this. So I'm pretty convinced that this was the way it was worked. But this is a question to all the Egyptologists here. How accurate? I, I know many people argue in technical things uh, about with, with pictures from Tom Waltz. Um, and I just, as a flintnapper, only knew this scene, and I read this scene, all the flintnappers of the other people said well, they're probably not really accurate. Um, what do you think? You, you are arguing, other, all, all, many of here are arguing with, with Tom Waltz pictures as showing technical details. And only in flint napping this scene, this shouldn't be the truth. I'm not sure about that. In fact, that is what's most interesting to me that in the experimental flint napping literature, um, these contemporary scenes, this flint nap, acts of flint napping seen by contemporary, contemporary artists and drawn on the Tom walls, uh, that they are almost non-existent in the experimental archaeological uh, flint napping literature. I think it's quite interesting. Well, careful. Um, Jacques Pellegrin once uh, had two uh, 
made clear about two things about flint mapping. One is, as we already heard a bit from Carolyn, is knowledge and know-how. And in fact, knowledge is the part you can learn by watching or by reading the stuff, and know-how is the stuff uh, that, that you can only learn by exercising. And flint mapping need quite much exercising. I'm sure there were many specialists at work. Yeah, worked. This is uh, refitting, in a way. And so now I have to prepare each flake for itself. You also see the stern turns a bit bad now. You see these inclusions here, which are gray. Um, we call them concrete. They aren't, of course. So now I try, let's, let's get a bit risky. I now try to get as far as I can here on the, on the middle of the piece for thinning. checking the angles because I may show it like this. So this is almost the way the tool strikes on the platform. And what is also interesting about this is, yeah. Now we get off pretty big flakes and in fact they look typical for, uh, of course they, they are like typical for, uh, um, for, for flakes you need for thinning pieces. In fact, as I already said, the fields around my home are scattered with them. Now we have the next hump, which is here. I'll try to get it off. Probably I get the cutting edge. Oh no. <laughs> so the, qu the question is, what did they picture there? Did they picture what is uh, the most time consuming phase uh, during the napping? The grinding of the pieces? Or did they paint that what was most spectacular to them in their eyes? Can you react to some of your questions? Of course. Um, because I've been looking at uh, basket makers and mat makers. Yeah. And the uh, mat maker, the big in Bali Hassan, is quite accurate. The attitude, in the way. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. I would be glad about that. Thank you. <laughs> so 
So now I did something completely wrong. <clears throat> I produced a step fracture. That means uh, the force wasn't enough to, to run through and also the, as I see now, uh, the surface of the stone which has to has always to be uh, um, convex. Um, here has a little concavity and so this flag stopped because I wasn't concentrated enough and so now I have a big problem because I won't get this, this, this away from this face. So there's only one way to get it off that would be from, from the other face. So now um, I start with the back of the knife. I have to. This, of course, is just because the material is wrong. again. Well, we have to, 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 to get another idea. Um, I'm pretty sure with with antler, which I'm much more used to, uh, I wouldn't have had this problem at this place. But now it comes. Well, now I, I'll try to get this off here. didn't made it. <clears throat> well, I'm not disappointed. <laughs> oh! That will happen nothing else. Sorry, please. I just want to show for a last instance, this is the best piece ever found in Egypt for uh, sawn from, from the view of Flint Napper. It's 72 centimeters long. Just imagine it's a piece of glass. If you put it at the handle and would just make a fast move, it would break. And this is percussion flaked. It's an absolutely miracle. This is absolutely excellent. I love it. I have it as a poster above my, above my bed. Okay.